You're listening to Cinematic Adventures, proud member of the Misfit Faction Media Network. Good morning, Vietnam! I love the smell of napalm in the morning. You're going to need a bigger boat. I feel the need, the need for speed. Roads, where we're going, we don't need roads. Snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? Vargas? We don't need no Vargas. I don't have to show you any stinking vices. You make me want to be a better man. Nobody puts baby in a corner. I wish I knew how to quit you. Love means never having to say you're sorry. He's looking at you, kid. I've always depended on the kindness. Strange. All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. Would you be shocked if I put on something more comfortable? You know how to whistle, don't you, Steve? You just put your lips together and blow. I'm not bad. I'm just drawn that way. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to Cinematic Adventures. If you're listening to us on the go, you can catch us on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and a bunch of others. Pretty much anywhere you get your podcasts from. Uh, As always, I'm Sean, and I am here, as always, with... Paul, Paul, how are you? I'm good, Sean. How are you today? I am good. I can't complain, except for the fact that the Jets are losing, which, you know, is pretty much par for the course. Sports. Yeah, sports. 9.30 in the morning game. Thank you, London. You have nothing I, to add I don't to know. That. I got nothing. <laughs> you have nothing to add to that. I'm I sorry. I don't do sports. No, you don't. But you want to talk about some... Halloween movies? Heck yeah. Oh, well, we are in week two of our Halloween month. As uh, For any of you out there who haven't listened to us before, catch our Nightmare Before Christmas episode from last week. I think it's a good one. I think we were featured on it. <laughs> I was about to say, we were not the stars of that episode. We were not the stars of that episode. <laughs> if you guys uh, haven't heard it yet, uh, the star of that episode was Ronnie from the Multiverse Fancast. Who, uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Decked so good- out in his Nightmare Before Christmas gear. Those the, you should have taken pictures of him and put it on the, you know, just you know, blow it up and blow it up and be around right, the studio. You know, it's like, hey Disney, this is this is what we got. This is your spokesperson, <laughs> pretty much. This right is your here. new spokesperson right now. Well, we were thinking of what we could follow up Nightmare Before Christmas with, and uh, I think we came up with a decent selection. Um, and we are going to talk about today the 1995 supernatural comedy slash drama slash sort of depressing horror That's movie why I said at times. Drama. Yeah. yeah. No, uh, and that is Casper. Not Casper the Friendly Ghost, just... Just Casper. Just Casper. They just couldn't Casper. afford the rest of the title because the budget was so high. Oh, apparently. Mm-hmm. Oh, Paul, what's your first thoughts on the movie Casper? This movie gave me nightmares as a kid. Really? Um, Just uh, just Kerrigan, when she turned yeah, into a ghost. She was, she was horrifying. She was, she was, she was, yeah, she was, she was terrifying. She, so this movie is unique in that it is, it is technically a kid's movie. For those of you guys who don't know, uh, Casper the Friendly Ghost, he... Um, He's based off the Harvey Comics cartoon. For those of you guys who don't know Harvey Comics, because obviously um, DC's kind of and Marvel are kind of the big ones. Harvey Comics have been around for a long, 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 since long the, time. Since the 30s. I, yeah. Maybe since, even longer. I, I think 1941. Oh, okay. 1941. So really quick, did we prepare and look at some of these things? No. But here are some of the more famous Harvey uh, Comics characters. We have uh, the Harvey Girls, Casper and his friends. So Casper was not just... Casper. It was Casper the Friendly Ghost. There was a character, Spooky the Tough Little Ghost. And yeah, the, 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 the Ghostly Trio. The Ghostly Trio, which uh, Wendy the Good Little Witch. And then uh, some other characters, Richie Rich. That's right. I think Richie Rich was like the most famous other character of Harvey Comics. I don't think anyone else is really, I guess, today is remembered as, as much as those two. Probably. Yeah, uh, Baby Huey. That's another one. Mm. I always thought, I always forget that uh, I get them, Harvey and uh, Archie, confused. Yeah. 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 I could have sworn Archie was. I think Archie has his own comic, though, like Archie Comics. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know who owns the Archie Comics, uh, today at least. It I don't is, know, yeah, it's called, yeah, just called Archie just Comics. Just called Archie Comics. It started off as a L- MLJ Magazines. God, the internet's awesome. I know. What but, would we uh, do without it? Yeah, I know, right? Who would so, be doing this? So, uh, Casper was featured in almost 55 <laughs> theatrical cartoons made between 1945 and 1959. And. He's been around for quite a long time. His first appearance was in 1939 in a children's book. And then in 1945 was his first animated uh, appearance in an animated cartoon. Do you remember any of the old Casper when we, when, when you were younger? I remember seeing bits and pieces, maybe like on syndication, some of the yeah, old. The I, only, I was never. The only one I remember was it was on the Disney Channel. It was like every year for Halloween they would show. It was Casper Saves Halloween. 
And that's the only like real exposure I had to Casper the character until this movie came out. Yeah. I mean, I remember more, obviously, this movie. And then uh, I did see some of the uh, the directed DVD sequels and yeah. stuff like that. But unfortunately, Casper is another one of those characters that's just kind of fell by the wayside a little bit. It, it's, it's, it, I mean, it kind of, to me, it, it just captures that 90s era where you were taking these properties that were, you know, family oriented and adding a little, uh, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Adult humor uh, to oh, them. Like, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Flintstones with the whole embezzlement thing, you know. <laughs> Uh, but I mean, what a time! I mean, again, you know, this is '95. I mean, this is in that stretch where they were just making all these movies out of like famous old-time, you know, properties. Casper, The Flintstones, Little Rascals was like the year before. And I think the the problem they ran into was, all right, we have this audience that's built in for it. You know, kids that grew up watching this stuff. But then we have also na- the kids. They're now adults who we want them to bring their kids. Yeah. So, but we also want them to be entertained. Yeah. Some some franchises do it really well. Shrek does it really well. Yeah, but I mean, Flintstones, I think, did a, did a really good job with that. Because, that, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to speak for myself. I mean, you know, going to see, I mean, you know, Flintstones was 94. This was 95, so we're seven, we're eight years old. Little Rascals, I think, was 94 as well. Love that movie, too. Um, Little Rascals is a, is a kid's movie. I don't really think there's anything, you know, they didn't really go, no. they didn't go anywhere with that one, but that one's just fun, and I could watch that movie now if I had to. We should make that into a drinking game every time there's a cameo in that movie, take a drink. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good, a good one. one. They had some good cameos in that movie. Miss um, Crabtree. But I mean, like, even as a kid, like, I never, I, I never had a problem with, you know, the embezzlement storyline in the Flintstones. It never occurred to me that that was like, you know, over the top, or even this with the whole, you know, backstory of Casper. I mean, like, I'm looking at the reviews of these movies that came out at the time, and you know, that's what they're getting criticized for. It's like, oh, well, you're making these a little too realistic. And I'm like... It's a ghost movie. Give us a little more f- credit, folks. Like, you know, yeah, we're kids, but we, we understand, you know, what's going on here. You know, it's like... You know, it's... Because, it, like, don't get me wrong. I don't, I don't think kids should be exposed to everything nowadays, but I think this movie did a really good job at... at at talking, at, at introducing the idea of dying to, to younger audiences yeah. and what happens when you die, and because you know it, it's it is the it's the the age old question. It's one of the biggest fears that most people have is what what happens when you die. You know, that's why you know if you have your faith, you're religious, you're whatever it is. Like people are always looking for answers, and I think this movie does a really good job um, towing the line and yeah. just kind of. It, I don't call this a kids movie. This is not a, it, it has some kid movie moments. I would say you'd have to be above the age of like seven or eight to, 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 really, to appreciate really appreciate this movie. This movie and not be terrified. By I it. wouldn't be surprised if this movie came out now for it to have a PG thirteen rating. I I think that's a. It, I it's, mean, it's I I I see your logic there, but just. I don't know, but like, like even like like a movie like The Sandlot nowadays that would get a PG thirteen oh, movie with yeah, just well, just the cursing. Uh, yeah. So I think for this movie because we're gonna, we're going to go through the plot like we normally oh, do, um, and kind of talk about some plot points. But I think this movie there are some scenes that are like they like the ghosts go to murder him, but they play it for laughs, and then obviously you know shenanigans. But uh, full spoiler alert for uh, Casper the Friendly Ghost from May twenty sixth nineteen ninety five. So before we do that, you want to talk? Are we talking the cast? We can. This cast is awesome. It is a very good cast. Um, so we have. Well, we're going to start with the human cast, and obviously the third, the star of this movie is Bill Pullman as Doctor James Harvey. And of course, the last name Harvey, based you know you know little uh, nod to the Harvey comics. Uh, he is a ghost therapist, and basically his wife has passed away you know years before the movie takes place and he kind of turns into this you know he wants to obviously find his wife who he believes is a ghost and he becomes basically he talks to ghosts and tries to get them yeah well that's what everybody says but it turns out he's he you know actually so knows what he's doing well i I have to laugh when they say the living impaired that, that's impaired. what they call the that ghost. But so basically, the the whole plot of this movie is start off with Casper seeing a, a news report on him, where he, see, well, he yeah. sees it on television. I mean, the, 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 yeah, because he. Uh, well, we'll go into that with the plot, but yeah. um, Christina Ricci, who is coming off of the Adams Family movies, she plays uh, his daughter Cat Harvey. We've done a few uh, Christina Ricci movies now. Did Sweet, we talk about the Adams? 
well, Speed, Speed Racer. Racer, Sleepy Hollow. Sleepy Hollow. We didn't do the Adams Family, though. Mm, we haven't we done the Adams Family. We still got two more weeks. That's true. Yeah. But, uh, so, fun fact about Cat Harvey. Originally, she was supposed to be named Wendy. Based off of the other character in the Harvey comics. Uh, Wendy, the, Wendy the, the good little witch. Good little witch. Because Casper and, and Wendy, who are two very, you know, hand-in-hand type characters with each other, they're they're both designed to be the, the good version mm-hmm. of, you know, typically ghosts are bad. Casper the Friendly Ghost was designed to be exactly what he says, a friendly ghost. And uh, Wendy was always the, I'm a good witch, you know, I'm not a bad witch type thing. So... I, I found it interesting that they they wanted to, but apparently it just came down to the legal ramifications. Because nowadays, these big studios own the comic book companies. Yeah. Like, Warner Brothers bought DC years oh, ago. Oh, that's been since the 70s. Yeah, so they were always <clears throat> able to use DC characters however they wanted. I think Marvel lasted the longest. Well, Marvel sold all their properties. Or they sold, sold the majority their, of But what I'm saying is, like, in terms of being owned by a they were, major they, studio. They were an individual studio for a long time, for a long Marvel time Studios. Until Disney bought them out. Yeah. Um, but you're right. They obviously sold off a lot of their, you know, movie names, rights to, yeah. their, to their characters, which, you know, ended up, I think, helping them. In the long run? In they the long won. run. They, they won, won completely. Um, which is hysterical when you think about it. Um, but here, fun fact on the Christina Ricci character, uh, other uh, names that were looked at and considered before she was cast, Scarlett Johansson really? and Kirsten Dunst. That's fine. Now, I feel like those two would have been perfect if it was the Wendy character. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I looked. Scarlett Johansson, I think, was only like 12 years old when this movie came out, so I could see that being like, you know, the case, if, of, it, the case yeah. of that. Um, Kirsten Dunst coming right off of Interview with a Vampire, so she was a big name at the time. I but just, I, I, think they, I think they hit it with Christina Ricci. Even um, though they call her 13 in this movie? She's like 15, I think. She's got to be. Yeah, I think she's like 15. Uh, but she she brings that – she's not as dark as like obviously Wednesday Adams. She's, she's fairly normal. She, she's she's a loner. To, she's, she's able to bring that loner vibe, but it was yeah. more like the 90s loner vibe, like yeah. almost like a grunge loner vibe. Yeah. But uh, some other names for uh, Bill Pullman. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we had uh, Tom Hanks. Mm-hmm. Jim Carrey, Steve Martin, Robin Williams, and Phil Hartman were all considered. And I, but I liked Bill Pullman. I really think it was just a good piece of casting because Bill this Pullman's is, not a star. I mean, he's not like yeah. He did Scary Movie three. He's not a star. This is the first thing I ever saw Bill Pullman in. Same. I was going to bring that up because I saw. We, obviously, we've seen Spaceballs, and but as a kid, I didn't see that in its entirety with him. No. So this was the first full movie that I ever watched with uh, with him, yeah. and I think uh, right after it was Independence Day, mm-hmm. and that was the second. I think I had seen Independence Day before I ever saw Spaceballs. <laughs> um, you can believe that. He was in Homeward Bound, The Incredible Journey. Molly's father. Oh, he plays the 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 little girl that's lost. Her dad. I haven't seen Homeward Bound. Oh wow, in years. that I don't is remember that. that is crazy. I did not remember that. But yeah, for me it was. Uh, you know the same thing. You know we saw him. In, I saw him in this, and I was like, "Wow!" You know, even as a kid, I was like, "You know, he's like a cool dad. Like he's he's trying his best." Yeah. And then it was Spaceballs, and then it was uh, Independence Day. I'm just going through his his filmography really quick. He was oh, he's in Titan A.E. That's funny. I like I like that movie. That's another movie that kind of got lost. Lake Placid. I saw him. I love that movie. It is so bad nowadays. Oh, it was scary movie four. Excuse me. God. Where the, can't the, get anything right. Can't dur- during the village parody. He gets hit in the he gets hit in the nuts. That's right. That's that's where Bill Pullman was at that time. <laughs> he was in the Equalizer, really. Uh, Equalizer two also. And then of course he makes his uh, return in Independence Day Resurgence. We don't talk about it. He was in a he was uh, in SVU. He did an episode of SVU. He right now is the Sinners his big thing. Okay. Yeah, he's still doing that. But well, I, I like Bill Pullman. I'm glad he you know he did a really good job and this was like a great first role for me yeah. to see him in. <clears throat> well, sticking with the live action cast, we have Kathy Moriarty. As Catherine Kerrigan Crittenden, would you say like, that three times fast? Would you like a fun fact about that? Fun fact: my my dad's cousin, so we called him uncle, but you know, like second cousin, whatever it is, went to school with her. Oh, so when we first saw this movie as kids, they were like, "Oh, Uncle Joe knows her." Yeah, so there, there's your fun fact. Didn't want to see Uncle Joe much because this woman creep, this woman freaked every little kid oh, out. God, she still does. It's her she, voice. She she was over the top, but in a good way. Mm-hmm. Um, you know. I read a, a thing when I was uh, looking online, and I guess when the reviews came out, you know, people criticized her performance, saying she was just trying to be like Cruella Deville over the top, bit. Cruella I, Deville, I, which I can see. But again, like you know, get over yourselves, critics. Like, stop. She was in Punks. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. Divided we stay. It's still one. We gotta eventually. Jessica we gotta Alba was it? Jessica, Jessica Alba. Jessica Alba was in that. Yep. Yeah. Well, so 
Catherine Kerrigan Crindon basically is the glue to this story. She is obviously the villain, but she has inherited the house that Casper lives in. So, you know, the, her whole mor- moral of the story is like, you know, she believes that there's treasure hidden in this house, and that's her, that's her, you know, her thing. And she's the one that hires Bill Pullman, but she's just a very treacherous and greedy woman. Fun, um, fun fact, she's also the only one that comes back for any of the sequels, but she doesn't play the same character. Really? She comes back in Casper Meets Wendy as Gertie. I oh. think she's one of the witches. Um, before she was cast, uh, Glenn Close, Kathleen Turner, Carrie Fisher, and Michelle Pfeiffer were all considered. I could see Glenn Close in this role. I could see Kathleen Turner in this role. Uh, Carrie Fisher, Michelle Pfeiffer, maybe. See, it's funny because like Carrie Fisher, after her death especially, you found out so much about her and just mm. how what kind of person she was. Like all really good things, but like she she'd be flipping people off. She'd be oh, like going was, skinny dipping. Like yeah. she was like a lot of fun. I would have liked to see her in, in a role like this to yeah. kind of see her stretch <clears throat> her uh, or you know kind of show off her acting chops. And then we've got uh, my favorite character, Eric Idle as Paul Dibbs. Plutzker, which I don't think you ever hear his last name. He even... only refers to him as Dibs, so yeah. the fact that his actual name is Paul is, is funny to me. Um, so this is my introduction to Eric Idle. I had not seen any Monty Python uh, you know, stuff before I see this movie. I just knew from my dad's reaction to him, and he would tell me about, oh, he was you know, part of a really funny you know, comedy group. You know, I'll, you know, when you're a little older, we'll, we'll, I'll show you him. So this is my introduction to him, and he's basically the comic relief uh, in this movie. He, he, he he's had... like her attorney. He has my... F- my favorite line in the entire movie right. when she goes over the cliff Kerrigan are, are you, you a ghost yet and then oh what a bloody waste she had my favorite sunglasses <laughs> oh still the best uh, and uh, some other names though some for, other uh, names we had uh, Gene Wilder I, he would have nailed it he would have been he would have been interesting Hugh Laurie mm. uh, Patrick McGuhan Stephen Fry Leslie Nielsen and Gre- Gregory Peck wow okay well, that's that's a reaching high right there. I think he would have been too old for that character, but okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, Wikipedia. I don't know how true this stuff really right. is. And then some uh, other names. We have Garrett Ratliff Henson, who played Vic D. Filippi, who is the cat's crush uh, in school. Fun fact: That's Guy Germain from the Mighty Ducks movies. Yep, I think yep. it's the only other movie I ever saw him in. His his filmography is very short. <laughs> Jessica Wesson as Amber, who is like the you know the, the popular the mean, mean girl, girl uh, of the story. Not a whole. She's got. She was on Boy Meets World. I remember her on Boy Meets World. Oh, she was Wendy. Yeah. The who buys on the the episode we always quote with the. They want you to take, take the, the roles. roles. Uh, we have Amy Brenneman who plays Amelia Harvey, uh, Doctor Harvey's deceased wife. She only has four minutes of screen time. That's a great scene. It's yeah, it is scene. a very good scene. Uh, ben Stein. As I always forget lawyer. he's in this. There you go. Uh, we'll mention the cameos as we go through the plot and stuff, and then obviously, then we go to the um, the voice actors. Mm. Um, so the main one is, uh, if I'm pronouncing this right, uh, Malachi Pearson. I apologize if that is not correct. He is the voice of Casper. Malachi. Malachi. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Uh, he is the voice of Casper. Oh, uh, he does a good job. I think he he cat. You know, he's not. Um, if everyone remembers the the voice of the Casper from the uh, like old cartoons, it's a very like high pitched. Yeah. Voice. He doesn't go that high. He just basically is like his normal voice. I mean, you know, I think he does a good job with that. And for those of you guys who don't know, this is the first movie that a, a computer generated character was the, the li- main, was the main was, was the, the title main. character. Yep. And so the, it was really hard, I'm sure, to find. They're, they're like I've, I've I haven't seen this movie in, in quite some time, but as you know, we grow up, we watch these movies, and we're like, oh, there are a couple of moments that it's it's a little dated, but for the most part, it holds up very well. Yeah, um, it's on free form a lot because they're doing their thirty one days, days of Halloween. Halloween. It's 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 one of those Halloween films. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, I'll be honest, it's not a movie I you know any other time of the year I'll be like, hey, I'm gonna watch Casper. If I see it on, I'll put it on. Well, yeah, that's yeah, fair. That's that's one of those that's movies because this movie. I think it. I think for me, this movie has gotten better with age. I agree. In terms of the the themes and the maturity, and I think we, I think we respect it more as adults because we they, see what they were, you know, what they were going for, what they were going for, and it, you know, you, you capture stuff more as an adult than you do as a kid. Yeah, and the, this kid, this actor Malachi Pearson, he really sells it when you find out about Casper's backstory. Oh. That's it's a, that's, hard that's to watch. A, that's a that's a tough scene. That and really like is. he brings he brings a lot of life to the character. No pun intended. <laughs> and then we have the voices of the ghostly trio. We have uh, Joe Napoti as Stretch, 
um, Joe Alasky as Stinky, and then the most recognizable one is Brad Garrett as the voice of Fatso. Love it. And you can never miss Brad Garrett's voice. It's very hard <laughs> to not know it's Brad Garrett. This is before he got big, though. I think this is right before Everybody Loves Raymond came onto TV, so he really wasn't known yet. I think he was strictly a, a voice actor at this mm-hmm. time, and you know he would be on TV like as guest you know, guest appearances and stuff. But that is, oh, we forgot one, Devin Sawa as the live-action Casper. Famous from? Come on. Oh, I know what you're talking about. You got about. this. Wild America. That's, not, Wild that's America? not where I was going with. Which one were you going for? How about the annexation of Puerto Rico? Oh, that's right. Little Giants. Little Giants. Yeah, Wild America. I did like Wild America. Final, and also Final, Final Destination. Destination. Yeah. Um, he, He's one of those one of those actors. He was one of the, it's like you know, one of those nineties, you know. He was everywhere in the nineties. Yeah, he was basically. one of those guys that just kind of popped up everywhere. I forgot about. I, I feel bad. I forgot about Little Giants. That's his first movie, Little Giants. Casper. Now and then. Now and then. Yeah. Movie. Who he would star in with uh, Christina Ricci. That's true. Yeah. Very true. Uh, all righty then. So now I want to watch Wild America of all movies. Jeez, <laughs> I like that movie. <laughs> it's yeah. it's uh, it's one of those movies that. Again, you see as a kid, and nowadays you're watching. Going, I really like this movie. Yeah. Like Free Willy, you bite your tongue. No, I like Free Willy. Okay, I was about but to I say. I feel like Free Willy's in that. You know. Oh yeah, the the kid saving the kid the, saving an animal. You know, the kid born to be wild. Day. The kid with the gorilla. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, do you want to take a quick break? I and think then... we'll take a quick break, and we'll be right back to discuss the plot. So, uh, bear with us, folks. We'll be right back. Hey guys, today's episode is brought to you by Raise Energy Drinks. Raise is a proud member of Rep Sports, and if you guys are looking for a little extra kick during your day, whether you need to tackle a workout or you need to get over that afternoon slump, you can always check out Raise Energy. And if you get to check out and you enter the code Cinematic, not only will you be getting a 15% discount, but you'll also be supporting the network. So that's Raise Energy with Rep Sports. Code is Cinematic. C I N E M A T I C. And welcome back. So we're going to start off with a little, uh, you know, backstory into the making of this movie. Casper, if you can believe it, is produced by the uh, the one and only Mr. Steven Spielberg. It's along with like the Flintstones and stuff like that. Spielberg had his hands in a lot of productions during the 90s. Um, but apparently he had wanted to do a film adaptation of Casper for a long time and uh, just never seemed to work out. And he finally... Uh, got a um direct uh, this is a movie done by a first-time director uh, named brad uh, silver silverling he had watched a episode of a tv show that this guy had done and was very impressed with him and hired him to uh do the movie um that's you know and then again the use of the computer generated imagery i mean we're a y- two years after jurassic park so the the whole you know cgi thing again is still in its in its infancy. I, in relative infancy. I mean, there are some scenes in this movie that you could say, okay, that's, you know, the effects are not the greatest, but th- they hold up. But also, you, you watch a movie like Jurassic Park, and it's hard to remember that the the amount of CGI uh, creatures in that that actually directly interact with the humans is very low. Oh, yeah. It's way more like the big, giant establishing shots are, are CGI. You know, like, obviously, everybody knows the, uh, the Brachiosaurus coming up on his hind legs. Yeah. Like, that's a whole big one. But then the rest of it is a lot of puppets and animatronics. Oh, yeah. And when it's not – when you see like like the Velociraptor scene in the uh, kitchen, whenever they're running or when he like runs into the the uh, the reflection of the girl, like that's all CGI. Yeah. It's, it's not – and then, you know, with some practical effects mixed in. And yeah. then it's a lot of puppetry. I think, I think the main – the main one where like the actor's eye level has had to be close was like when they're when the uh, Sam Neill and the kids are running away from the Gallimimus, you know, yeah. they they had to kind of look as if they're looking at them and stuff. But for the most part, whenever an actor was relatively close to a dinosaur, um, it was one of the the animatronic ones yeah. that made it easier, obviously, on the actors and stuff. But this is like, this was the whole. Staring at a tennis ball, you know, this keep your the tennis, eyes this tennis on the time. tennis ball, you know, and that's Casper or that's Stretch and the, the yeah. ghostly trio. Did so, you ever see uh, The One with Jet Li? No. So The One with Jet Li is another one of those movies that they – that was when like CGI was really starting to come in. And they, they showed behind-the-scenes stuff of uh, – Jet Li would actually be kicking those tennis balls because there would be people. Oh, okay. So, like, it, great, like, really cool stuff. And that also a testament to, to the actor who's able to do that kind of physical stuff. But I was like, 
you know, we watch like behind the scenes stuff now with like Thanos and and Hulk, who are completely CGI characters, but like also still real. Yeah. And it's incredible how they're able to do some of these things now. But it, it really, it's a testament to Casper where. There are very few times where it feels really strange. Um, we were just watching the uh, – the, or I was watching it. You were listening to it. The scene where they do the, like, the little song at the end. Yes. And Bill Pullman and Christina Ricci both have to grab Casper's hand. And so imagine just being an actor and you just, you're standing there. You're holding a physical person's hand and then you're pretending with the other one. Yeah. And I don't – I wonder – I don't think unless they were using a, a kid who was like all – in, in, in like I don't even the, think they had the green suit. That's true. You know, like I all mean, that stuff. You know, I know a couple years later they did that for Sleepy Hollow where they put the green uh, stuff over Ray Park's head to make him the headless so they could horseman. they just digitally remove it. But, yeah, I don't know. That's that's a good call there. Um, you're right. I mean, it's very, you know, you, you hear actors, uh, especially back then, um, explain like what it was like filming these movies. Again, you know, hearing Sam Neill, Laura Dern, and Jeff Goldblum discussing making Jurassic Park or, you know, I, I haven't actually heard – any interviews with Bill Pullman or Christian Ricci on how tough it was to do this movie. But you hear the whole like, oh, this is the, uh, you know, looking at nothing there. It's, it's, it's hard, you know, it's really hard. So it's, it's, it's a challenge to do that. And it's a testament to a lot of actors that they're able to pull it off and make it look real. Or even like Ian McKellen will talk about all the time how difficult shooting the Hobbit movies were. Hobbit, you know, Lord yeah. of the Rings. Um, the one I remember, Raiders of the Lost Ark. I mean, that's 1981. You know the scene at the end with the with the arc. I yeah. mean, those actors were like, "There's nothing there. Like, yeah. how do we like you know?" Or uh, Bob, how do we react Bob to Hoskins. This? We talked about oh, it in uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. That might be the greatest performance ever with with any type of of not there or something. Yeah. Not, even though that wasn't CGI, same concept. Yeah, I'm, you know, it's it, it's mime work. I mean, you had to go to mime school for that stuff. It'd be like doing a podcast with one host. <laughs> it is possible and it's, it's possible. doable. I'm sure I could. But what? Oh yeah. What? <laughs> Thank you. But uh, yeah, I, as far as movies go, I love talking about movies like this where this movie is considered groundbreaking in a lot of regards, but it's also, you know, it, people forget about it. Yeah, it it, it falls in that era, 90s era of like kids movies. Again, though, it's like it's not a kids movie as I do air quotes. This is almost that. like 1980s PG. That's fair. Yeah, like That's very, fair. very Goonies style PG. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah. I, I can see that. Like they were going to Indiana talk- Jones and the Temple of Doom PG. <laughs> uh. <laughs> for your heart. Thank you, Mr. Spielberg, for the PG-13 rating. I All appreciate right. that. So are you ready to jump into this? Sure. You're going to you're gonna go through the plot. I'm going to go through the plot, but there is one part here that they didn't even mention in our plot description. Oh. So the movie opens up with two kids breaking into Whipstaff, Whipstaff Manor. Whipstaff Manor, which I love that shot where they go under the gate. Oh, yeah. It's and, creepy. And you see – it's a, I'm, I'm assuming that's a mad shot of the house, of yeah, the mansion. Yeah, yeah. And that music, I mean, James Horner did the music for this movie, and I thought he did a oh, great job, it. because again, it's it's like, oh, this is going to be creepy? We can't tell if this is no. creepy or fun, or what is it? So these two kids on a dare, like very childhood, like oh, very, a dare to yeah. do this, go into this house that's supposedly haunted. The whole town knows it's haunted, and they have to take a picture of them in the house. So they start arguing who's going to take the picture because this is back when you could not do a selfie. No, you couldn't just like... take a picture. I mean, I'm sure they could just turn the camera around, but so they have the giant Polaroid with oh, that uh, does that the spits uh, out the uh, that spits out the picture and yep. it, like you know develops in front of you. So they're fighting as to who's going to take the picture, and you hear a voice say, "Guys, don't worry, I'll take your picture." And the camera gets taken away, and a, and you hear say cheese. And the picture goes off, the kids scream, and the picture drops, and the two of them are just, like, horrified. Oh, yeah, and it's a great, you know, as the as the um, <clears throat> credits start rolling, you know, the picture's developing. And then, of course, you see the f- final uh, picture of the two kids freaked out, and then finally we get the, the title card of Casper. But what they do a good job is you don't see – you see bits of Casper. Just you his see, hands, I think. You see the hands, and then you see, like, the reflection in through the body when he first approaches the kids because, obviously, you can see through him, but you don't see his face. So I thought that was a good job. They waited to, uh, to show off Casper. And so, then, of course, you get the lovable Casper, the friendly the, ghost theme, you know, by James it. Horner. It's still, it's still so catchy. So <laughs> the movie takes place in Friendship, Maine because why not? That's a, I think it's a real place. Yeah, yeah, in Knox County, Maine. Nice. Look at that. We were watching. Uh, I forget what we were watching last night, but they mentioned Westchester. We're like, we know that place. I love. I love That's when you watch like Law and Order, where you're like, you hear like Law you know. and Order did uh, the Lake Mahopac Police, and I was like, wait, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> All right then. So, following the death of her father, we get introduced to the spoiled heiress Kerrigan Crittenton. I'm just gonna call her Kerrigan for the rest. Of them. 
Because even <laughs> Miss Crittenden, that that lady. <laughs> She discovers that she all she's been left by her father is uh, Whipstaff Manor, and all of his money has gone to various uh, different charities. Always so, love, and Ben Stein is the will reader. Yeah, the, like, she's like, "What did he leave me?" And he's like, "You know, reading off like you know, one toothbrush. One, you know, like, like you know, just these random charities, and like you know, gets all the way down the list." Yep. So in a fit of rage, because I, they never say that Dibs is like. Like, they're a thing. Yeah. But, like, obviously, they're partners in this. They're partners. He's, like, her lawyer. And I'm sure he was going to get some big payout from all this. I'm sure. Percentage. So, Kerrigan gets angry, and she throws um, the paperwork into the fireplace. And, you know, Dibs freaks out because he's a lawyer. He's like, no, you need all these papers. And he, the fire reveals that on one of the pages that there's a, a treasure map or a treasure hidden somewhere in Whiffs that Manor. Uh, Buccaneers and buried gold. Whips that doth a treasure, treasure hold. hold. Good job. Thank you. Thank Is you. it right there in front of you as you said that? No, no. <laughs> but um, bravo, sir. Bravo. Thank you. So of course they they go to the house that's now theirs theirs to live in, mm -hmm. and they get intercepted by Casper, who tells them don't scream because you're you're gonna wake up my uncles. But of course, natural reaction they freak out. So. The ghostly trio makes their their first appearance, and they're funny in this. They're they're the they're yeah. besides dibs, they're the comedic joy in this movie. But so they scare the two of them out of the house, and they have to figure out how to get the ghosts out of the house. And we get one of our best cameos ever. Well, one of the first the first one is uh, the actor Don Novello, and he plays Father Guido Sarducci. Now, you know. To a, to a kid in 1995 like I was, I had no idea who this was, but my parents, you know, of course, laughed hysterically at this because he was like a recurring character on Saturday Night Live, like the first couple of years of Saturday Night Live. So they, of course, you know, laughed at that. So obviously by them laughing, I laugh. But then, of course, you get – he goes into the uh, into the mansion and, and comes all you, out. all you hear is like the throw-up noise. Yeah. And you're like, oh, okay, where is this going to go? And he walks out. His neck is literally broken and, like, turned 180 degrees. Now, here's the chart that's, one of the, that's one of the you know, weird CGI effects. As you can tell, it's not real. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> the funny thing is she just talks to him like nothing's happened. But Eric Idle's like, the hell? What, what, what's going on here? And oh, it's no like, problem. Piece, Piece of, cake. of cake. And then we get probably, as a kid, you're the most, like, Re recognizable. So camera. I remember seeing this in theaters. I, I, Me too. And I remember hearing somebody else in the theater go, oh, Ghostbusters! Because it was wonderful. Oh, yeah. So Ray Stance in full Ghostbuster gear comes running out and he says, Who are you going to call? Someone else. It would have made it a hundred times better if they got all of them to do it. But oh, my God. Could you yeah. imagine? That would have been legendary. I'm actually impressed that they were able to. Um, I'm wondering. Because this is a universal movie. Obviously, Ghostbusters is owned by or was Barrett. done at Columbia. Yeah. Um, but I think at this time, the Ghostbusters ride was still at Universal. So I wonder if they so had, had like that a, legal standard. They had they had like a deal or something in place that they were able to get Dan oh. Aykroyd in the movie, which is great. But um, but so they decide they're going to demolish the house. Yes. I, I always forget about the scene, they, but the ghosts actually managed to stop it. Well, they scare they scare all the workers yep. off. Yep, nobody wants to do it. <laughs> it it's wonderful. Now. We get introduced to Casper, who you can tell just in the first two scenes that he's just desperate for human – for some sort of connection besides his uncles. His uncles treat him like crap, and it's still weird that he has to cook for them, but okay. So <laughs> he's watching uh, TV, and some of it's like funny. Like he sees Mr. Rogers. And there's which, an actual cami uh, an actual uh, uh, cartoon of Casper. You don't see the cat, but you see yeah. one of the reactions of seeing Casper. Which is which is always funny. And he comes across a news report. Like it's a, it's a segment piece on Hard Dr. Harvey. Yep. And who's talking about? He basically he's a therapist for the for ghosts. He's never actually seen one. No. But that's like he. You can assume he was a famous therapist until then. I think they might or, have. Or a they therapist. Might have yeah, they might have mentioned it. But um, then when his wife passes away, he devotes his entire life to to chasing ghost stories, basically. Yeah. So it isn't until uh, Casper sees Christina Ricci, Cat Cat Harvey, that he's like, hmm, me likey. I mean, it's Christina Ricci. You can't go wrong. Oh, no. So he manages to trick Kerrigan into calling them to come live at the house and <clears> deal <throat> with the ghosts. So we get introduced to Kat and, and uh, Dr. Harvey, and you can tell Kat is not happy with all this stuff. This it's is like, like the 10 millionth time that he's dragged her, you know, across, across the, the country. country. 
you know, she has the great lines like, I've been to nine schools in two years. I can't make a friend, yada, yada, yada. Mm. You know, and he makes a bet with her or a deal saying that if I don't find what I'm looking for, which means his wife, yeah. um, this time around, you know, we'll stay or we'll go somewhere permanent. You know, mm-hmm. like if it's, if you don't like this place, we'll find some place to, you know, live, you know, for, for a while. So that, that sets off right there. Yeah. So <clears throat> they're in the house, they're unpacking and Casper makes his presence known to them. It does not go particularly well. I love, well. I love he's like trying to talk to me. He's like, eh. He keeps, yeah. And she like throws a sock in his mouth and then he becomes the pillow. Again, good, if, like, those Some hold, fun effect. those hold up. I th- I really do think it they makes hold you, up. It makes you wonder though, <clears throat> does Casper choose when he, is he just like by default, is he able to touch things and then he can choose not to? Because some things will go right through him yeah. and then like the sock gets stuck in his mouth. Uh, I, think, I think maybe because he was trying to get in touch with her like he was in. Maybe, but I think it's just that, that aspect of, of that humor where it's just like you don't really yeah. think too far into it. So know? doesn't he spit the sock out and it he spits hits her the socks out and hit her and that's what she, she reacts to. And she to. faints. Oh, yeah. She faints first and then when she comes to, she screams. And the scream is what summons the uh well no the no it summons the you know he you know you know uh, dr de- harvey uh yeah and then the ghostly trio is coming back yeah so casper tries to distract them by asking if they wanted to eat outside tonight because they don't want people to know that or they don't want the the ghostly trio to know that the harveys are there now but so cat tells her, her dad i saw a ghost like you were right this is all real and he tells her stay here i'm gonna go investigate because that's what I do. Living impaired, cat. <laughs> and he's walking around with a flashlight trying to make contact with the ghosts. And I think the same thing. As soon as he sees one of them, he faints. Yeah. And then the ghostly trio, I love this, they dive in like they like they go they possess him basically in a, yeah. in a way. And then of course Fatso like jumps in and he's like shimmying his way in. Because <laughs> Cat also gets locked in a closet. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's she gets right. locked in the closet after she gets out leaves her room. And so Dr. Harvey wakes up and he can tell something's not right. So he goes to the bathroom and he goes to wash his face because that would be my immediate reaction. Well, and this is, I think, a good nod to the scene in Poltergeist. It doesn't obviously end the way the Poltergeist scene does. Yeah. But it's something that you could be like, oh, what are we going to see here? You know, I'm sure audiences and adult audiences are like, oh, are they going to spoof the Poltergeist, you know, here? But And they do a little bit. They do. But we get what we get is basically, you know, three very funny cam- not funny but like three surprising cameos right in a row um starting off with uh Clint Eastwood followed by Rodney Dangerfield and then Mel Gibson and then followed by you know I guess you could call it the a crypt- cameo the Crypt Keeper yeah which is funny because I think Mel Gibson's the only one that doesn't say anything doesn't say anything I don't think well no Clint Eastwood he does he has, speak a, he has a line and then he kind of very dirty hairy like line and then Rodney Dangerfield and all of for a bridge playing friends <laughs> you think you got it bad I got a facelift or something like that. I don't a remember typical what Rodney Rodney Dangerfield joke, but it was funny. But it, it that was as a kid, I think I, I, I think I only knew the Crypt Keeper. I don't think I really knew. Well, that was the time for us. You know, you know, that was when like, it was the biggest. I really wasn't big in Eastwood yet, and Rodney Dangerfield. I hadn't seen Caddyshack yet, and then Mel Gibson. I don't even know if I knew that was Mel Gibson because he doesn't say anything. Yeah. So just, huh. that's another you know you know. But we just found out uh, via the trivia um, that each cameo is supposed to be sort of a representation representation of the three ghostly trios when they were alive eastwood is stretch um fatso is ronnie dangerfield and stinky is mel gibson so fun fact i yeah. thought so Har- dr harvey obviously freaks out and he runs away and the ghosts come out of him and you know they have like he pulls the shower curtain fatso's in there showering like you know, they do the, they, they scare him and so he decides to fight. He decides to have a sword fight with them. Yep. Yeah. He pulls. What was it? An umbrella that he grabs? I think it might have been an umbrella. Yeah. And then of course we get the, the, the vacuum cleaner. Yeah. Well, Casper lets uh, Cat out, yes. and you know, like she lands on top of him, and he's like, "Are you okay?" And she screams, and she's running, and then she runs downstairs, and best reaction, she's like, "Dad, he's having like a sword fight with the ghosts," and then so they they like they kind of give him a little bit of a beating. Yeah. It's a fun, it's a very fun interaction. Fun I can interaction only imagine scene. what it was like to film it. Yeah, it's one of those you know you could tell again you know Bill Pullman is obviously fighting nothing you know yep. I mean but it, it, it's a fun scene. Doesn't one of them use a plunger? 
I, I vaguely recall like oh, da, da, da. he uses a plunger on Stinky. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he like and he like pulls it and it it's and one of the ways he gets uh, him out of there. Um, and so then, he manages to grab a vacuum cleaner. Yes. And he was able to suck up the ghosts. <laughs> okay then. <laughs> So they're like, all right, we did it. We, we stopped them for now, but they'll come back. And then, of course, they pan to the vacuum cleaner bag, and you could hear them in there. Yep. Like, you know, get it, get it. And even better, the next shot. Like, So obviously, they go upstairs and go to sleep. <laughs> Seriously, they stay in the house. Bravo for them. Yeah, uh, but the next shot is her, is Kat opening the door, and it's just the dust buster buster. going side to side, and she comes out, and she's like glaring, <laughs> like that's going to be the thing. So she goes to make breakfast, and... Casper reintroduces himself and you know he he tells her don't scream if you scream it's gonna wake up my uncles and they get really cranky I I know I'm a ghost but I'm a friendly ghost and it's a great scene and like this whole scene is fantastic um and he makes breakfast for her and they they have their time to kind of just kind of chat and and you know like what can you introduce yourself what can you do because she and one of the best she goes can you can you hurt me no can I hurt you no and it's and like the music just really like it's a very touching and poignant mo- uh, moment. Yeah. And then Doctor Harvey comes down. And he's like, "Uh, the hell is happening?" And I love Casper. He's like, "How do you want your eggs?" Blah blah blah. Paper, Hong, Hong Kong Express. Sure. He goes. He gets him a Hong Kong newspaper. And you know he like asks. He's like, "Cat, are you okay?" Like he's like, "She's like, yeah. Like he's cool. We're we're friends now." So and then the ghostly trio reappear. Yep, and uh, one of the grossest scenes oh. in the entire movie is when they're eating and they're panning below them, and the food's just falling, just falling out. through. But it's like still getting like chewed. Yeah. So it's all gross on the way out because yep. they they make Casper. Uh, he's, I, he's Casper takes out the <laughs> dustpan and he's like cleaning. He's like, no, we're supposed to leave that for when we're hungry later. And he's like, but well, we, we have, have guests. Com- we have company. Well, company loves misery. <laughs> I always like characters that like take the common phrases and ruin them. Yeah. Like uh, Biff Tannen's a famous one. You know, you can't make like a tree and, and get, get out, out of here. It's make like a tree and leave. But <laughs> so, Cat actually stands up for Casper. He does. She does. And her, her and Stretch have a great like back and forth. And some of it's really funny. Like, get a pulse. <laughs> like, there's like, and what do they call? You know, they call them the flesh bags and stuff like that. It's it's really funny. And she goes, drop dead, too late. Ah! They're almost like the the old men from the Muppets, uh, Waldorf, yeah. and yeah, a little bit like that. I mean, they, you 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 realize fairly quickly, like they're not evil. They're just bored, bored, you mischievous. Know, they're poltergeists. Mi- yeah, they're mischievous. They're not like scary evil guys. I mean, you find that out fairly quickly. Yeah, they're, they're just they're doofuses. They're doofuses. They're angry. They're 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 you know they're annoying. Stuck. They're yeah. stuck because we do find out that all ghosts in this ha- are they're there this because world. they have unfinished, unfinished business. business. Casper and his uncles don't remember what it is at this point because your memories go as you grow as you say a ghost, yeah. which is another great concept. Um, but I do love when he, when it pans over after Cat leaves to go to school. It pans over and you see the three of them just sitting there slowly eating and quietly, and you hear. And he's like, "All right, guys, so uh, we're gonna have a great day." Blah blah. And they all throw their food at him, and he just stands there and he's like, "All right, it's your hour." I was like, the most badass therapist line. Here he comes. So Kat goes to school, and Casper decides he's going to go with, um, which is also a fun little entertaining scene because they do the most annoying thing ever in a school where they have to have the new kids stand in front of everyone and say who you are, what you do, where you've been. And we also get introduced to – what's uh, the boy – Vic. Vic. Oh, what a dumb name. Just Vic. Vic. He doesn't look like a Vic. He doesn't look like a Vic. I'd rather call, – call me Victor at this point. All right? But um, so he kind of introduces himself to Kat by helping her out with the locker and you know chatting for a little bit, and he's in her class. Now, Vic has a girlfriend named Amber, and Amber is the worst. Oh, she's horrible. She's horrible. The, Amber's the typical popular mean girl who everything's got to be done her way. And this is obviously a very small town. <laughs> uh, very big Halloween party later, but very small town. So – when they introduce her, she tells everybody that they're that she's living in Whipstaff, and they're all like, "What?" Like the whole class goes just go silent. Oh, it's yeah. really it's a really funny scene. At the same time, because the kids were mean to her, Casper ties all their shoelaces. That's so great. I so feel like great. it's a little over over the top for you know, like only Amber was kind of mean to her. The rest weren't. Oh, they laughed at her. Yeah, but so Casper they, doesn't know that. <clears throat> they try and uh, 
they they want to have a Halloween party, and originally they were going to do it at Amber's house. I, even the way she raises her hand at, when she's like, at my house, raise your hand. She's just like, like a circular thing. Whip staff? Hey. Can you imagine being a teacher just being like, yeah, we can have the party at your house. It's fine, right? That's cool. I don't have to, I don't have to approve that at anything. So they she agrees, and uh, Amber and Vic immediately start their planning. <laughs> I always felt Vic wasn't really part of the planning. He just was like, you know, the, just along for the ride. Along for the ride. He was and he was get, too afraid to. He was uh, hoping go. to get that uh, outside the school quick handy. Oh yeah. yeah. He, he he does. He has no balls to uh, go no. against Amber. So I, it's, I'm scared of her. So Har- Dr. Harvey's trying to do therapy with the ghost, and they're just not being cooperative. Not being. Nope. But they're <clears throat> they're trying to avoid him. But they also tell him that they know his wife. They know Amelia, and that if they, which is. Which is when you think of it, just that's just mean. If they like are, you know, because you don't know, are they serious or not? Yeah. Like, you know. So they make a deal with Dr. Harvey that they're going to do their therapy sessions with him. If they, but in exchange, he's got to get them to get Kerrigan to leave them alone. Mm. And they'll go find Amelia so he can talk to her. So, you know, they, they, they promise to go through the quote unquote red tape. And there's the great scene of when, you know, you think it's Amelia, but it's actually just Fatso. My man! It, it's, it's very entertaining. So Casper and, and Kat start getting to know each other a little bit better. And Kat finds out that Casper doesn't remember anything about his life as no. a human. And she's kind of starting to explore the rest the of the house. Because it's a giant mansion. Oh, it's huge. I mean, there's probably places in there that haven't been touched, you know, forever. The spider webs alone. Oh, yeah. So she manages to find, we don't know it at the time, but she finds a room. And it's almost – it's very well hidden. It's through the attic of all places. I think so, yeah. It's very strange. Like, where are we going to put our kid? I'll put him upstairs. So she finds this room, and you just see her smiling, and – Yeah, she's opening up boxes and like, ooh. Yeah, it's really nice. And it cuts back and because Cas- Casper's looking for – no, is this the the lighthouse scene? No. The lighthouse scene first. Oh. Uh, yeah, okay. so before this actually happens, excuse me, Casper and, and we get the first uh, can I keep you. Which is so creepy. It is so creepy. So creepy. <laughs> the ghost being creepy. Who knew? But Casper and, uh, like, basically, Casper wants to just hang out with Cat and just be with Cat. Yeah. But she's like, no, I'm doing homework. I'm doing this. I don't want to talk to you. I think like, she already told him that she was going to the dance with this guy, Vic. Yeah, because he, I think so he So, of course, Casper is, you know, jealous. So, he takes her. Uh, we get the whole, he puffs himself up into, like, a superhero Follow me if you want to live. And he carries her out the window and to a which is a great scene because he drops her yeah (laughs) and then he's like barely struggling he's like struggling to get her but um he takes her to a lighthouse and he you know that's when he tells her i don't remember being human i don't remember my life it was years ago i think they say it's like in the mid 1800s or something like that that. maybe yeah that's good i don't remember yeah so cat finds his old bedroom and restores it to the best she could um and you know putting up trains and stuff like that and casper goes in there and she, because she feels bad, so she's trying to help him because you know she, they become friends very quickly, which is you know obviously movies got a movie, but so he goes in there and he remembers everything about yeah, his everything life. Everything starts to come back. He remembers his train. He remembers having fi- the the five fingers thing is like it was it was funny, but at the same time like very poignant. I was like, yeah. oh, I didn't I didn't even notice. For those of you guys who don't know, animation it's a lot easier to do four fingers. That's why a lot of your shows like even like Family Guy stuff like that. Four finger characters because doing five just makes the hands look strange usually. So he goes into the attic, which is it, it's very unclear if it's nearby or if it's because it it could be separate. I don't remember. So he goes in there. He gets like a dress for Cat that was his mom's that yeah, definitely right. needs to be washed. It was in a trunk for three thousand years. But she wears it no yeah. problem. Right over her jeans and like long sleeve hoodie type shirt. And she's basically in that dress for the rest of the movie. Yep. Doesn't change. <laughs> Doesn't wash her hair, nothing. Oh, these cobwebs make it uh, even better. Now, he's – um, it was after the dress scene was when they find the sled. They find the sled and they find and that, the, this the, is the photo albums. Photo album. But the sled is like – that's when it – that triggers – Casper remembers how he dies. How remember how he dies. And it's such a – the way he just – he's talking and describing it. I mean it's heartbreaking. Well, it's even worse because – so Casper goes into detail that he wanted this wooden sled, and his dad finally got it for him. And he he played outside for so long, so long, so long, ended up catching a cold and dying of pneumonia. Yeah, it's the only time that they've actually described how Casper died. Yeah, and that's one of the the things the critics were very against when the movie came out. So 
he stays as a ghost to keep his father company. And that's another reason. So I guess he does remember what his unfinished business is, but well, now he can't finish it. Well, yeah. His, his father, dad's his gone. His father has been long gone, and he, you know, now he had, and he forgotten everything else. So Cat finds a newspaper article that, decla- that fi- we find out that Cat, um, excuse me, Casper's father was declared insane because Casper basically haunted him into insanity. I don't know if he haunted him into insanity. He does, he does say that he was, they put him in. Uh, an asylum because he was claiming that he was getting visions of his dead son. Okay. And that he built a machine to revive him. Yeah. So everybody's like, he's crazy. And, you know, but they do mention specifically that he was seeing his dead son, which, like, again, ramifications. I mean, it's just, like, horrifying. And as she's reading this, you know, Casper has another member, and he goes, the Lazarus. The Lazarus. So, and then one of my favorite scenes when uh, he tries to pull her. Yeah, and he goes through the wall, and she hits it oh. and falls backwards. It's like, and oops, got to take the long way. So, the same time, we find the ghost. Doctor Harvey decides he's not going to. He's he's giving up. He's giving up on all this. He's going to pack up his stuff and leave. And the ghostly trio decide to take him out to happy hour. And during happy hour, we see the ghost pull him out the window, and Kerrigan and Dibs are there watching because they're they're spying on this whole thing, and. They just they realize the ghosts are out of the house. We can go in right now and get our stuff. <laughs> cool. So they go inside at the same time that Casper's taking Cat to the basements. They have to take the long way though because you know she's not a ghost, and it's it's a fun little like very clue type thing. You know the the bookcases that are sh- are swinging book and cases, you know the chair like that the goes chair down that moves. It's this whole like. Um, the up and atom machine. The up and atom machine. So basically, it's what Casper's father would use every morning to wake him up. And it's a, basically a chair on a conveyor belt. Yep. And it would like comb his hair, shave him, like all these things. Shave him, I think, give him a cup of coffee or something. I don't know. B- a bow tie, to uh, brush his teeth. So, so this is all happening to Cat because obviously it can't happen to Casper. So it's a funny scene. And I love when the razors come down. She like ducks. Yeah, because she's small. She's small. So they get down there. But then... Uh, Dibs and Caroline. Dibs and, and Caroline are doing it. <laughs> Dibs is getting all the. Uh, I, all I just love it. He, when the, the shaving cream. When the uh, the blades are swinging, he's like, ah! And he just moves his hands like, like against them. Karate moves. So <laughs> it was so great. Casper, they get down there and they find the machine and they they manage to bring it back um, to the surface. They find the button that, uh, under where? What was the oh, book? The, uh, Frankenstein. Frankenstein book. And yeah. I love I love the scene where she hits the button and, and Casper's like, like, "Hey, I did it." And she's just like She smiles and closes. Yeah, yeah, you did. Yeah, you, yeah, did. you did. You, you got just, this, buddy. You just tried your best. So, there's only one vial of the formula used to create life basically. Yeah. And there's only enough for one ghost. This is a plot point. Pay attention. It even went right to the camera at the time. So, they they start the machine thinking that it could you know, bring Casper back bring to Casper life. Back. During that, though, Dibs manages to get in there, steal the formula, and take it out. Yeah. And Casper turns into bacon and eggs. That was funny. Am yeah. I alive? Am I alive? And then, like, his eye is, like, just the yolk, drooping. and it yep. just, like, falls to the side. That was a fun little effect. Now, this then goes to Kerrigan and Dibs, where they're talking, you know, this is basically immortality. You could die, become a ghost, do what you need to do, and then we can bring you back. Mm-hmm. Like, you, you can't – there's no ramifications. And we Dibs very quickly realizes that Kerrigan's about to kill him. If you were a ghost. If you were. Oh, yeah. Ah! And she tries to cut his head off. It'll be an axe. Now, and then th- it just becomes like a cat and mouse game. So this, this, this scene always bothered me as a kid because it then cuts to Dibs in a suit of armor. And he's, like, slicking the floor. And as a kid, I was like, I didn't think that was him because it happened so quickly – and there was no build up, there was no transition to it. It's just something like he ran. I'm wondering if there was a deleted scene in there where There's it's probably it's extended probably, at least, yeah. You know, it was supposed to be extended. But it was funny. It's very funny, especially now as an adult, I get it. Yeah, and then but of course she sl- she <laughs> slides, <laughs> goes out the door, and you know, he chases after her. Dummy. And she tries to kill him with her car. And he manages to he hits it with uh, the statue head. Hits the windshield and she goes off the road. And she crashes. I think the airbag even goes off. Airbag goes off. But she has this. She has a funny. It's like Dibs, you were taking this way too personally. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, okay. And then she opens the car door to get out, and Falls. turns out she was on a cliff, and she drops. Oof. And just her like ah, voices. And like, then my yeah. favorite line: Carrigan, are you a ghost yet? Carrigan. 
Yeah, it's it. She had my favorite sunglasses. Oh. But then we get probably the most. They, they still cut this line out when they show it on uh, TV. Oh, the. Uh... So sh- you just see the the camera pans back to an overhead shot, and Dibs is walking away from the cliff, and you just see the shadow of Kerrigan, like a giant shadow, appear on the ground where he's walking, and you hear her go, "Not so fast, little man," and then she says, "The bitch is back." They cut that line out off TV whenever you watch it. Ugh. And it's even more awkward because it's just him turning because she's still talking, but he's not doing anything. So it's just dead silence. <laughs> and uh, so now Kerrigan's a ghost and Dibs is now the, the patsy, more so. Then it cuts to your local bar and it's karaoke night with Dr. Harvey and the ghost. So it makes you wonder if the goat, if like the, the in, whoever owns that bar just knows that the ghosts are going to come in for happy hour every wonder, once in a while. Yeah, because there's like. Because he no, doesn't react to them. Doesn't. Was he, there a bartender too? There was, and he's. Because he starts crying when Dr. Sure. Harvey does his little speech. So Dr. Harvey's boxed. Oh, he's Obviously, gone. the ghost. gone. The ghosts have beers, I think, but they <clears> can't <throat> drink. So so they're they're totally sober. And they start they start talking about how much they actually do like Dr. Harvey and how much fun he is and how much spirit he's got. And now it's time to make this a quartet. And I love it because they all go to kill him and they all have something different. Like they – I think Stretch breaks the bottle over Stinky's head. So it's like a jagged bottle. Yeah. One has a harpoon and then one has a gun. It Very, very like – Three Stooges. Very Three Stooges, Scooby-Doo type level of silly. Yeah. Not that Scooby Doo ever had guns, but anyway, except for Scooby Natural, that doesn't count. But so they're they're sneaking, and he decides he's going to have a moment with. And it's even better because how drunk he is, he can't. You can see all these weapons when every time they put them behind their back, <laughs> he doesn't. Even know. So every time he go, they go to kill him, he turns around and looks at them, and he tells them like something really nice. Like first, it's like, can I get a little personal? You know, and he he tells him he's like, you know what, I'm going to tell that lady because he can't pronounce a uh, Crittenton. He keeps trying that you're not going anywhere. It's your house. You haunt it. Possession is nine tenths of the law, which and, is a fun play on that word. Yeah, you know, like. yeah. And he, you know, he tells them that he loves them and he's so happy that he met them. And they Doesn't all start kiss them. Like he, he kisses all three of them, and they're like, oh. They all start crying. What a and, guy. And so this is one of the the best times that that they mix the physical, uh, like practical stuff with mm-hmm. the computer generated. He throws the harpoon and it lands in the wall and you hear it twang and it actually uh, swings back and forth. But then the, I think it's uh, Fatso's got the shotgun. He tosses it and it lands and it shoots up, breaks the wall and the wall la- or parts of the wall fall on top of the uh, the guy, the bartender there who's, That's right. who's crying. That's right. <laughs> so Dr. Harvey's like full of life. He's ready to go. And he's like, all right, boys. The night is young, and, and he's walking backwards, and he's like, "We're gonna booze it until you see we the, lose you it." You see this like out of order, or, like, like a road, working. like almost road work construction, yeah, right, and, right outside the bar door. I don't, I don't exactly remember what he thought. Like, it's it, like a construction site. Yeah, but it just made no. I thought it was in the bar. Like, I always thought it was in the bar. Like, no, it was it, like a, he's going through the doors because the doors open up and then yeah. they close as he's going. Yeah, come on, come on. And you see ah. them are starting to react to. You know, They're like, like ah. And so, then you just hear him fall, and you're like, wow, they went there. Okay. And he died. Wow. So we cut back to the laboratory, and because they're trying to – she's inflating Casper. That's right. With the, the old-timey, uh, like, air blower thing. And he's like, I think my ears just popped. <laughs> and Kerrigan comes flying well, down. The, the school, the, 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 oh, the end the, during this. The, dan- they, the, the kids arrive first, so she has to go no. answer the door. No, because she has the vial. Remember, they get it back from Dibs. Then they get in the chair and go back up. Oh, because you hear her laugh. They hear her you, laugh. You do. But so Kerrigan and Dibs come back down, and mm-hmm. Kerrigan takes the, the treasure out of the vault because uh, Casper pointed it out while they were down there. And Hey, my treasure. You know, you mean my treasure. Dibs comes down. He gets shaved again. And she's like, what are you doing? This is no time for a shave. He's like, I'm helping you, remember? Remember, remember what? what? This. And he, and he holds up the vial, the Lazarus vial. So... Casper manages to scare him. He falls backwards into the water, and Casper grabs the the vial. Him and Cat take the chair back That's up. That's right. He pushes her like really fast. Yeah. And stuff so like that. and then as soon as which is just the same shot, just reversed, but uh, just going up the stairs. Yeah. No, I got but you. um, so they stop the chair, and you hear the doorbell ring, and Casper goes, "Ugh," because it's the party night. Perfect timing. So they go downstairs, and 
thank God everybody came at the exact same time. Oh yeah. Yeah. The the teachers dressed as a lobster. We're here. Hope you guys brought some food. So, you know, she's like, all right, this is the room. This is where we're going to party, and I'll be right back. Because she's dealing with, uh, like, literally ghosts. Oh, it's down a manhole, by the way. That's what it was? Okay. So uh, the whole party comes in, and you hear Kerrigan laughing, and it is is so scary. Terrifying. Yep. So they go back down, and – right? They go back down into the lab? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. so they go back down into the lab, and – you know, basically, they confront Kerrigan, and they manage to trick her into saying that she, because um, I think Dibs gets the uh, the vial. Did well, she turns on Dibs and basically like throws him out the window. Yeah, uh, punches him. Punches him. Well, because he he decides that he he finally stands up to her. Yeah, and he's like, "No, I've got the power. I've got the treasure." And she's like, "You got to fight," because he's like, he's and he also does the bitch line too. He's like, you know. You can haunt me all you want, but it's going to be in a great big expensive house with purple wallpaper and, and a, a little, little dog, dog named Kerrigan. A uh, bitch just like you. Like, okay, Dibs. <laughs> but then you basically And then she ass- definitely – she yokes him right out the window. Then you assume he's dead. You have to assume he's dead. And Kat and Casper managed to trick her into saying she's got no unfinished business. Cause she, and she, technically she doesn't. She has her treasure. Yeah. She had what she wanted to get. So, Yeah. So they manage to trick her. She uh, creepy, like she like basically blows up ghost wise. Yeah, like, she definitely went to hell, but that's not the point. Uh, um, Cat manages to catch the Lazarus vial as it drops, and Ka- and Casper's treasure falls, and it turns out to just be a baseball signed by Duke Snyder of the Brooklyn Dodgers. Of the Brooklyn Dodgers, and you know the map was part of a game that he had played with his father. Now at the same time, because you know this isn't a terrible day for Cat anyway. Dr. Harvey comes flying in. And I like how he still has his cardigan on. <laughs> That's right. All he's, the, got all, the soul, he's got the soul patch going. Well, I think that all the old ghosts just lose their clothes eventually. Probably. Like, as they lose their identity, maybe. But like all the new ghosts, like Kerrigan and, and Dr. Harvey, all had their clothes on still. And so James comes down, <sighs> and oh, it, is a, it is hard. It's rough. I mean, Christina Ricci is like... She's bro- broken. She's devastated. She's broken. She's just like... I can't believe this is happening. She's now an orphan, and we don't yeah. even talk about this. And he's already forgotten everything. Yep. Which, you know, and, and so she's Cat, like... Cat Baloo! And it takes the pinky promise that they have at the beginning of the movie to... Uh, and, of course, the, the ghostly trio are there, and they're they're laughing. You know, they're like, oh, well, you know... This is fun. This like, is fun. This rookie, is what we, you know, what we wanted. So she finally gets him to remember... You know, he does, she does the pinky promise, and and you see it on his face, and he's just like. And again, for for this wasn't the time where they would take the actual actor and yeah. put them into that CG character. They had to animate that with Dr. Harvey yeah. or uh, Bill Pullman, and it is it probably did. the best example of of mixing the two worlds. And it's be- it's, it's a great well shot. done. It's a great shot. You see the realization come on his face, and he and his voice acting. I didn't, you know, you don't think Bill Pullman and voice actor together, but no. he. Killed it. Killed it. And and you know she's on. She's crying her heart. You know, and he's just like, "What have I done?" Yeah, and, like what and, happened to me? And then Casper just you know like, sacrifices. Sacrifice. Well, sacrifices his you know future chance. and chance to to come back. And he's like, you know, come on, Doctor Harvey, you need this more than I do. Mm-hmm. And and Cat's just like Casper. And you know, what do you? It's the way it's, it's got to be. It's the way it's got to be. And so they do it, and it works. So Doctor Harvey's now back alive. And they go up to do the to the dance. Yep. So they're going up, and you know, Casper goes up to his room. the The ghostly trio scare off Amber and Vic. That's right, because they were looking to uh, to prank everyone, prank everyone at the party. Really, really horrible costume too. Like, yeah. I mean, like if anyone fell for that, I would have been like, really, guys. I you're think that? it would have been better if they'd done some sort of like a, a water prank. I don't or, know. I don't know. Like, some buckets. They just that was like it was like you guys really think this was gonna work? Yep. And so basically what it was was Vic was standing, yeah. Amber on his shoulders, which is what he wanted all along, and they were wearing like a giant costume yeah. to make it seem like they were a giant ghost. Can, can we just say the scene where obviously after they get scared and they're running and she falls oh. off of him? Yeah, she's dead. Like she, she, she should have been dead. dead. Like her head slams on that floor. Like and then he drags her. Drags her too. I mean she should have been concussion <laughs> like – out of it, yeah. But she just continues to scream, and he just pulls her off. So it's a it's a great it's a great little uh, nod. And of course, everybody starts clapping. Even oh, yeah. the teachers like they they think it's because they think Cat planned it. Yeah, yeah. So Casper's up alone in his room, and 
he's playing with his baseball and the baseball suddenly stops dropping. Yeah. And he looks up and he's met by Amelia, Kat's mom and Dr. Harvey's wife, who's yep. now an angel, and thanks him for what he did and you know, as a reward for his self sacrifice, he gets to be a real boy for fourteen minutes. It's like ten it's midnight? Ten. Wait, Cinderella got till midnight. Cinderella, Cinderella wasn't 12 years old. 12 years old. But it's like, hey, uh, it's like 9.15. Yeah, like, you, you suck. Your timing is horrible. Why couldn't you do this an hour? Why couldn't you do this when we were fighting ghosts? I would have been helpful. <laughs> but anyway. So, so, it's great. It really is. So he goes downstairs. Well, you get that You get that like 90s slow dance song Because Kat's up. the only one sitting yeah, by herself. basically. And you just see him like slowly walking down the stairs and it's like he's wearing you know, like almost like a pirate costume sort of something thing something like that like he's a puffy got, like, pi- shirt like pirate boots yeah he and looks he, like uh didn't uh Jerry Seinfeld the puffy the puffy, the puffy shirt. shirt I don't want to be a pirate yeah. but and, he's just you don't you don't see his face and you can tell Kat kind of knows I don't think she knows at all but like she's got this look on her face the entire time she's like there's something about this guy. Well, yeah, she looks at him immediately because he's going straight for her. Yeah. You so know? he and takes she's her to like, the dance floor. Yeah. And, and they start da- dancing. And then they start floating. Well, she finally, yeah, she realizes like... Uh, they're floating she, in midair. Nobody else does. No. Because uh, when everybody looks, they're back on the ground. And Casper, and he, starts, he like, says, I told you I was a good dancer because he wanted to go to the dance with her. Or just go to the dance in and general. Then he, and then he has his he famous... Says, Can I keep you? <laughs> and so she, reali- she realizes who he is and, you know, they hug and they keep dancing. At the same time, Amelia goes to meet with James and tells him that she was so happy with her family and she knew that he would take good care of his da- of their daughter, that she had no finished, unfinished business and told him, you know, move on and that the ghostly trio had actually been the ones to find her and bring her there, which is, I think, really cool. Um, I do like how she's like, you know, French fries aren't a breakfast food. Don't wear, don't tell her to wear a shirt under her bathing suit. Like all that, all that fun stuff, and like the parent stuff. And, you know, she tells the clock literally – he got one song. Ba- basically. One song. Literally. Like, I would have been like, hey, come on. It's like going to a strip club getting one on. song. That was 20 bucks. One song. So she promises that one day they'll be together again and disappears back into the light. Casper manages to give Cat a little smooch, a little something-something, and then turns back into a ghost. So technically, for half a second, she was a necrophiliac. But anyway – I wanted to make. I wanted and of to course, that's when everybody notices uh, Casper. Casper, and I love it. He turns around and he's like, "Boo, boo!" Yeah. They all freak out. Like people's hair goes up, like yeah. very cartoony in that way. And they all run out, and you know, it's not good, bad. Good not pump. bad for my first party. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. and then they have their little. It's not over yet. Where all of them dance, and the ghostly trio singing the song. And that is Casper. That is Casper. Oh, such a great movie. It really is. It re- it really is a great movie. Like. I, I again, this movie. It this is one of the reasons I like doing our podcast because we look at movies that we haven't. Like it's very easy. Sean and I talk about the same movies very often. We do when when especially like we'll do quotes from like movies. Like there was definitely a couple of Clerks two quotes today, a couple of Men in Tights quotes just when we were at breakfast. Like so, for those of you guys who don't know, every Sunday we try and get almost basically basically the entire Misfit faction together for the most part, and we go to uh, a local place for breakfast, and we you know we try to make it fun. So we try and make it fun. Make it's, it fun. God, we're all you. just like half asleep, going like, "Why did we do this?" Sean actually chugged his coffee at one point, and I was shocked. Like hot coffee, I was very impressed. I was like, "I was like, I need more. I need more. <laughs> yeah, bring me more. Another." So we we tend to go through the same movies often, or even watch the same movies. You know, you know, you get, you get your comfort food. Um, but yeah, and then we'll go see a new movie, and we'll talk about that movie. But the, doing the podcast, it's always a lot of fun when we look back at movies and you realize how much you love this movie and well, yeah. how, how important it I was. I mean, we, when we first started doing this, you know, it was kind of like there was those select movies where we were like, oh, we got we to gotta start with this. You know, we got to start with that. And then we get to a point where, okay, now there's movies we obviously haven't seen in a while. You know, and again, Casper is not one of those movies that we watch every couple of weeks. This is a movie yeah. you watch maybe once a year, if that. I mean, I don't think I've sat down and watched this movie all the way through for a couple of years until I saw it last night. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you, you, you want to you want to know what you're talking about. You want to, you know, watch these movies and, and you watch and I'm watching this and I'm like, well, you know what? I really enjoy this movie. You know, it's just it's a really well done movie. And, you know, it opened it opened at number one over the Memorial Day weekend back in 95. It, it did grossed, well. Uh, it grossed sixteen point eight million dollars for its first three days uh, and ended up with twenty two million um, over the four day weekend. And let's see here. 
It played solidly all through the summer, ending up with a final gross of $100.3 million just in North America and $187 million internationally. So worldwide, it grossed $287, basically $288 million. And it was on a $55 million budget. So it was a commercial success. Very big. Mixed Very reviews. Dead. Mixed reviews. But again, you know... Like I'm sorry, but when you review a movie like this, it's like, can you get can you get over yourself, please? Like, stop, you know. But there, it got some, you know, like Roger Ebert, who's not generally like favorable to a lot, unless it's like an Oscar, you know, movie. He gave it three out of four stars. Said it was a technical achievement, very impressive, um, even a little winsome philosophy in the movie. Um, you know, Leonard Malton, who I like a lot, he gave the film a bomb rating. You know, he he was not happy with. Uh, the portrayal of Casper as a deceased child rather than just a ghost. I'm like, well, what do you think a ghost is? A ghost is a dead person. <gasps> it is? So it's like, come on, you know. you got to add a little to these characters, I think. I mean, I, I really do believe also, that. Also, I, I feel like if you're going to do a movie like this, like <clears throat> you can take a little bit of creative liberty. And it's not even creative liberty. It's, it's just adding to it's the character. It's just adding to the movie. You're, you're, you have to add meat to the bone. Like, there's this whole... You know, Casper is a is a comic book slash cartoon character. You know, the cartoons were a couple minutes long. Mm -hmm. He had a couple of specials throughout, you know, the 40 years. There's nothing really much for you to go on here to make a story out of this. So, like, you got to add something to it. What is the motive? You know, what is the driving factor of the character? Mm -hmm. What is motivating him? You know, what all this stuff. So I thought they did an excellent job with this movie with you know, how you treated the character of Casper. You, you, you obviously still gave him the lovable aspect for the kids and you added a little like, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Sustenance. Uh, yeah. Yeah. A little sustenance. You add a little, uh, heart and a little, uh, pathos to the character. I mean, again, as we said earlier, that scene where he remembers how he died. I it's mean, hard. You know, as a kid, I probably didn't appreciate it, but as an adult, you're watching, I'm like, that is just depressing. I mean, he's describing how he, like, And realizing died. it, too, at the exact same you know, time. It's like, like, I begged for this sled. I was outside for way too long. It was I my got own sick, fault, yeah. You know? And, and my, my dad, dad got him. sad. Like, yeah. like that, just, that just hits you in the heartstrings. So, you know, like a movie like this, it's not like they it, – it's not like they were like, you know what would be really cool? Let's make Casper green. Yeah. Like that that is a that's a like a big change, and a big departure. And they didn't go over the top with like adult humor or anything no. like that. So it wasn't like not uh it was not like it was objectionable to children. Mm -hmm. You know, again, there were some adult you know, adult tier moments that maybe yes, a seven or eight year old won't fully understand. I'm not gonna lie, did I really understand some of the jokes when I was that no. kid? No. But you like the imagery, you like the the, the physical humor that was in the movie, you know, you like the jokes between the ghostly trio and Bill Pullman, and you liked it like Eric Idle, you know, was funny. There was stuff there for kids to enjoy, and then there was obviously stuff for the adults to enjoy. That's what makes a good family movie, mm -hmm. you know. And and I, again, I I I look back on this movie and I'm like, you know, and and as they say here on Wikipedia, there was a sequel planned for the movie. They had a script, you know, in the works, but right after this movie, both Schedule, actors yeah. were, you know, obviously attached to other projects and wouldn't be available for like another year or two. So it, they ended up just doing the uh, cartoon show that was on the Fox Family Channel, and that lasted like two years, but I have not much recollection of it. Neither do I. Um, so, yeah. well, overall, Paulo, st Star City rating? I'm going to give Casper a, a four. It is, right. um, as far as like movie itself goes, probably like a three and a half, but just it's got so much nostalgia for me, and it makes me think, especially as an adult, it's like some of, the, some of those deeper moments really resonate well with me. And, you know, obviously – doing what we do and, and doing a podcast about movies, talking about a movie that that shouldn't be a technological marvel, but it is. And yeah. people forget about it. And it I remember seeing it as a kid and I remember seeing it over and over again. And I lo I really do love this movie. It is a big, big part of my childhood. When yeah. I think of like, there are very few movies that I remember seeing in theaters, you know, before I was like maybe 10. And this is definitely one that not only do I remember seeing, but also like I, I'm not saying having nightmares is good, but it stuck with me apparently. Mm. So yeah, I'm gonna get I'm gonna give it a four. Uh, I agree with you. I'm gonna give it a four as well. It's it's definitely as you just said. It's one of those movies I I remember seeing in theaters. I remember my parents going, "Hey, we're gonna go see Casper this weekend." I'm like, "Oh, awesome!" Because I knew the character. You know, again, as I said before, I'd seen like you know a Halloween special with the character and stuff like that. So I was aware of the character. Um, but again, yeah, as a kid watching that movie, again, you, you, you like the effects, you like the whole ghost, ghostly trio. But then as we got older, 
you know, you respect the story, you respect, you know, the the uh, the pathos the character brings, you know, and stuff like that. What they added to it, um, the effects. I mean, just the effects. And again, most we talk about, you know, movies, you know, where effects are kind of like they don't do the movie justice anymore. But this movie, I still think there are some. Some wonky Some moments. Some wonky moments, but for the most part, the effects in this movie hold up, and they do a very good job. They do a very good job not having the the ghost hand things to people. True. That's they, always one of the hardest, because yeah. the only way they could do that back then was they would have the, the plate or whatever it was on a wire. Yeah. And they would have to do wire work and mm-hmm. have the person catch it, and sometimes you could see that they still have the wire on it, so they don't they can't really grab it in a normal-looking way. Yeah. I'd say for the most part, I'd say 95% of this movie holds up effect-wise. I agree. Yeah. I agree. As I said, I think the, the, the effect with... Uh, the uh, the priest at the beginning where he gets his head turned around. Yeah, was, you, you could you see, could the, see you could that, see the transition. Shot. Yeah, you could see that that it's clearly CGI. That I don't think he's really in the scene with them. So basically, what they uh, actually what I think they did was they had him walk out normal because his feet are still normal. Yeah, and his, and his body's still normal. It's just his head. They put the wig on backwards, so Probably, it was covering right. his face. So he yeah. walks up, and then they had another shot of him where he's turned. And they had to find a way to transition it. It's the transition when he it's, turns it's that putting, looks wonky. It's putting the head looking this way on the body that's walking normally. You so know? basically what they had to do was they had to film the scene twice. Yeah. They filmed the scene of either him or, or a body or, double yeah. walking down with the with his face covered by the wig. And then they ended the shot, reestablished where he's facing them. Because you don't see his feet or anything anymore. Yeah. And you can't see his hands, so you don't know which way anything's facing. So they just put his shirt on backwards, kind of like uh, Spaceballs. Yeah. You know, which is funny because Spaceballs, he's like, my head's on backwards, but also his hands are too. But uh, I didn't tell me my ass was so big. Yeah. And they had to just use CGI to transition it because they decided to have him turn so that his face would pass the camera. Mm. Had they gone the other way, it maybe wouldn't have looked so wonky. Maybe. Mm. Maybe. maybe. But that, that's honestly, like, might be the only... A fact that you could just say, okay, that that's, jumps, jumps to mind. that's like, you know, early, you know, CGI effects that maybe they just don't work. But for the most part, again, and I, and I think your, your, your reasoning is a lot. They didn't really have a lot of physical interaction with the ghosts mm-hmm. and people. You know, they have a couple scenes and well, stuff they, like they that. Well, they mentioned like Christina Ricci was being held by a uh, fish wire, yeah. which is a, a bio, like a very thin bioluminescent, I think. No, mm-hmm. not bioluminescent, but bio, uh, some sort of, mean. you know what I mean. I know what you mean. So that you, it doesn't pick up well on a uh, camera. Yes. Well, this was fun, Paul, as always. Yeah. Really? As always? As uh, all, uh, I think we have a good time. Now, I, can't, I can't speak for, you know, your times on Multiverse Fancast, uh, but, you know, on, here on Cinematic Adventures, we have nothing but a good time. That's fair. That's fair. Thank you. So if you guys would like to hear more of Cinematic Adventures and our good times, you can find us on Facebook at uh, the Cinematic Adventures Podcast. You can also find our uh, pu- our mother site, which is the mother, m- mother site. Mother I panicked. S- the Misfit Faction. You can find that on Facebook and themisfitfaction.com if you're looking for more content, including uh, reviews and uh, biographies, stuff like that. Links to all of our podcasts, the website. We are doing uh, some additional work in the next couple of weeks that we're planning on, but we'll see what happens with that. And you can also find us on Instagram at The Misfit Faction. You can find us on YouTube, The Misfit Faction Media Network, and on Twitter at Misfit Faction. If you guys want to hear more about us or more from us, please let us know. Talk to us. Like, comment, subscribe, all those things, especially on things like Apple Podcasts. Um, everything you guys do that uh, involves listening to the show really helps. So we do appreciate all the things you guys do do. <laughs> do do. Before we go, uh-huh. speaking of which, we do have Fan oh, Feedback Friday. Oh, that's right. So I'm trying to do Fan Feedback Friday where it's a little bit more um, Halloween themed for this month. So we got a couple of responses for this one. If you could go to a Halloween party with any movie or TV character, who would it be? Because obviously this movie ends with a Halloween party. Uh, we had Charlie Brown, I Got a Rock. Yep. Yeah. Uh, we had uh, The Witches from Hocus Pocus. Yeah, oh, that's a good one. Not if you're a kid. Not if, uh, no, but this is just if you're an adult. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, more Hocus Pocus. And uh, with Count Dracula, I feel like... Uh, I think it'd be a good time. Good thing I'm not his type. But anyway. Think so, uh, yeah, time. Fan Feedback Friday was fun this time. I liked it. It was good. Yeah. It was good as always. I think I, I enjoyed Fan That was a good idea by you. Thank you. Thank you. It's going to be Halloween themed all month. All month. Well, again, as I said before, folks, if you haven't heard uh, our Nightmare Before Christmas episode, definitely uh, check that out. That was last week. And uh, we're going to announce that next week we're, um, we are going to do uh, the ni- uh, 1994 uh, Disney movie Hocus Pocus. Now, we need, a, we need a, a favor from you guys. Producer Melanie needs to be on the show, but she's not sure if she will be. So we need as many 
comments on everything we post for the next week saying that they want producer Melanie on the show to talk about Hocus Pocus. Ooh, challenge accepted. Yep. Hopefully she doesn't listen to this episode because I found out she does listen to the podcast and I got to be careful. Yeah. But anyway. Hi, Melanie. Hey. So, yeah, make sure you guys uh, – Everything that we everything that we post. Hey folks, she should be on. You know, pass it along. She hasn't been on since uh, Mel Brooks. Yeah, Mel Brooks month. Yeah, shame. I uh, know. Well, as always, I'm Sean and I'm Paul. Everybody out there, have a wonderful rest of your time and happy Halloween month. That's very good. Thank you. <laughs>